Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Pondering Christianity. I uh, hope you guys are having a fantastic week. I'm super excited to bring you guys this week's video. I'm here with Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller, go ahead and wave to the camera. He's, hey. uh, he, <laughs> yeah, excellent. He is here to discuss some excellent uh, near-death experience information with us. He is the Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the Kennesaw State University in Georgia. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let him take the reins real quick and give us a bri uh, brief background on himself. So go ahead, Dr. Miller. Sure. Well, I um, met Jesus when I was in high school at a retreat, really changed my life. I didn't really have any doubts or questions about the Bible at the time. But as I began growing my faith and talking to other people, I came across a lot of issues that caused doubts in my life. And some of my friends could just dismiss them, but I had to always study things out, study both sides of issues in order to come back to a, a, a faith in God and in Christ. Uh, so I, I did that informally, reading book after book when I was in high school. Uh, then I went to um, several colleges, undergrad, uh, Dalton College, where I studied liberal arts general, then to a uh, Columbia International University, where I majored in Bible and studied my Greek and things like that, to where I could understand biblical texts better. Um, went to the University of Georgia, tried to take the classes there that I thought would be hardest for Christians to deal with, like psychology of religion, philosophy, uh, classes of that nature, logic, mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted to make sure I understood the other side. Um, I just thought these issues were important. Then mm -hmm. I went to uh, Trinity for graduate school uh, in Deerfield, Illinois, because they had some of the top intellects I felt William Craig was talking was teaching there at the time I studied under him and others that had, had really studied in the best of both worlds secular and Christian studied apologetics mainly there and finished up at Southwestern Seminary so basically this gave me a good background in uh, how to study uh, hermeneutics and exegesis and how to study texts philosophy and how to think through things and um, uh, biblical studies like Hebrew and Greek so that I would have the tools to come out and keep studying issues as I need to deal with them. Excellent. Excellent. And so what kind of prompted you to want to get into near-death experiences specifically? It was by accident. Uh, actually, I ha if with all this study of apologetics through the years, um, I'd never even run across near-death experiences, even though Moody wrote his book in 1975, kind of introducing them to the world. I just, I just thought, well, it's just somebody's personal experience. What could that possibly have to do with evidence for mm -hmm. God? Uh, but I did have a relative who had read the little book by the boy who, little Colton, who had uh, did the Heaven is for Real book. And... Um, and she wanted me to read it, and I thought, well, I'll read it as a favor. And so I read it, and I thought, well, this is just one person's experience that you got to trust. So it's not really, to me, a strong apologetic. I don't know the family. I don't, I don't know the whole thing. But at the end of it, there was a quote by a person who said, hey, uh, this is consistent with my studies of near-death experiences. And I thought, people have been studying this? Well, I ought to go in and check this out. So sure enough, I found out that after Moody, scholar after scholar after physician after physician after cardiologist had been actually going in and doing their own studies, publishing them in the academic journals, writing books on it. And I thought, my goodness, I can't believe this has been going on. And, and what I found were just some very persuasive uh, lines of evidence that these were actual experiences in many cases with the afterlife. So uh, that's what got me into it is really by accident. And, uh, and then I began interviewing people around me within my own circles of trust, which made it even stronger. Right. And in then that, in that sense that it, it kind of went from being in the, in the study world to now it was being revealed to you as it's in everyday life and the people that you know in the circles that you trust. It's not just something you see as an ivory tower discussion where some scholars are kind of going over these large studies to find this information. You saw that it was relevant within your own very circles of people that you knew, your circles of trust, as you refer to it. And, and, and I think that's one reason that some of these experiences are so powerful. So uh, with my students at Kennesaw State University, I'll teach intro to religion classes. Uh, often and 
in those, I have them read a little book of evidence for, for the existence for God. I go through 17 lines of evidence and I ask them to uh, rate each line of argument as to which is the most persuasive to them. And interestingly, they're all over the board. So sometimes when we hear discussions today in apologetics, people will talk about the beginning of the universe or the moral argument or something, and they'll give three or four arguments. And those are good. They're persuasive to a lot of people. And some of my students will say those are the most persuasive to them. But probably, uh, well, I say probably, no, a higher percentage of my students tell us persuasive things like miracles, near-death experiences, deathbed experiences, more will rate those as the most persuasive to them for the existence of God. So uh, the, the neat thing about these experiences is that they're so widespread, like uh, 4% of the U.S. population in Germany will say that they've had a near-death experience. That's one out of 25. Hmm. Deathbed experiences where people are like in a hospice and about to die and they start talking about visiting with relatives and angels on the other side. A recent study in a New York hospice found over 80% of the people having these experiences. Wow. So what I find with my students is I, some of them will say the reason this is the most persuasive to me is that my uncle so-and-so, I saw him die and I saw this happen. Or I had a near-death experience in my own life. Let me tell you about it. So these are very common. And as I begin talking to my relatives and friends, people that I trust, not, not just studying researchers out there that are doing their very objective research, but when I saw, hey, I can just start talking to people and hear these stories over and over, that added a new level of evidence to what I was already seeing. Right, right. Excellent. Yeah, I think that that is the interesting part about it is it seems to just be in everyone's day in life and we don't even know about it until we begin having those conversations. So that's a really unique perspective on the, on the near death experience. And then he also mentions deathbed vision. So for any of you who aren't uh, familiar with uh, Dr. Steve Miller's book, here it is near death experiences as evidence for the existence of God in heaven. This is how I came across him. Um, and Personally, I would highly recommend this as one of the best books to get into near-death experiences if you are unfamiliar with the field. And then from there, you can kind of begin to study some of the other ones like Van Pommel and uh, Jeffrey Long and some of those others. But uh, Dr. Miller does an excellent job in that book of presenting near-death experiences from a very objective, as much as he could be objective perspective. He's honest about his uh, presuppositions that he's coming into his research with, which I think is the first step in the right direction for anyone who wants to work on this field is understanding how their, their beliefs are affecting the way that they're interpreting the evidence in which they're gathering um, instead of being blind to the idea that their beliefs are probably manipulating the evidence to give them the outcome that they want from it. Um, so let's get into it here a little bit. So the first topic I'm, I'm interested in discussing is, do you think um, NDEs, Dr. Miller, are consistent with any particular religious worldview and why? Uh Yes, I, I believe that it's very consistent with Christianity. If you look at the main experience as studied by, uh, by scholars who are taking a whole bunch of examples from their own cardiology practice or whatever, when, when they, in these professional interviews, begin talking to people, uh, what they're saying to me is very consistent with Scripture. Now, what you're going to find is that like in any field, there are going to be some spurious experiences out there. And you're going to have some people write a book about their experience just to make money or, or the book later is found to be fraudulent. And I think that's what we have to be careful about is that you're going to hear all kinds of doctrines and things if you just look on the Internet for experiences. But once you stay within the real studies, it seems to me that, that this primary experience is very consistent with Christianity. And also, it's not consistent with certain other beliefs. For example, um, if, if some people in Eastern religions, not all Eastern religions believe this, but some would say that, hey, pretty, pretty soon after you die, you, um, uh, you're going to be reincarnated. 
Uh, well, in a near-death experience, often people are seeing relatives who have died a long time ago. So that doesn't seem very consistent with some other religious thought, but it's consistent with Christianity, which would say that there is an afterlife. So in my book, toward the end, I just kind of go through the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, and say and list out a whole alphabet of things that are in that are, that are revealed in near-death experiences that I believe are consistent with Scripture. Okay. So I, I, there's just a lot of dovetailing there. Right, and and that's something I really appreciated about it. Now, what would you say to someone who is a Christian, but they kind of see near-death experiences as you know, it's, it's difficult to interpret these experiences with what we find biblically speaking. And a lot of people might refer to revelation, but saying that revelation isn't necessarily to be taken literally or to be taken um, exactly in the sense that it was kind of a coded um, letter being written. So what do you think about some of the scripture, especially where Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what the, what the Lord has planned for us. What do you what do you have to offer us in ways of how to interpret that? Does is that out? Does that rule out us using near death experiences as a way to kind of see what's behind the veil, as it were? Well, I agree with that scripture that no eye has seen or ear heard what's planned for those who know Him. Um, nobody knows that whole scope of it, and it won't be until we get to heaven that we see all things clearly as he sees them now, as in 1 Corinthians 13. So, uh, yes, that's fine. We don't know the whole scope. But the Apostle Paul said that he visited the third heaven and saw things which were of which he, he couldn't really speak. There were things going on over there that, and that could be interpreted to mean not that he was told he couldn't say anything, but it was just too marvelous for him to express which is one of the main elements that Moody from the very beginning said of NDEs. He said, um, they're ineffable. People will say, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like this, but I can't give you the whole picture. Um, and then we see uh, Stephen at his martyrdom in Acts. He looks and he sees the other side. He sees um, uh, God, yeah. sees Jesus, and he says, uh, and, and wait a minute. Okay. He is seeing something on the other side. So to say that we can't know anything of the other side, I think is unscriptural. Hmm. Uh, also, I think it's very, very needful for us to distinguish the ultimate heaven that we will experience from what people may be seeing in near death experiences. So you go into revelation 21. Well, this is after the destruction of the old earth. You've got a new heavens and a new earth. This is future. This is future heaven, right? Right. Of, of the way things are going to be. I think that's really what Christians are expecting. When we die, we're going to see the pearly gates and this and that. But but this is something that's future uh, in, in Revelation 21. I think that there are, like Paul suggests, he speaks of the third heaven, there's several realms that are spoken of as heaven. And I think this may be what people are seeing on the other side is more like a vestibule or entryway. Um, I know one of the first experiences that impressed Dr. Moody was a fellow who became a believer, became a serious believer because of his experience. But he talked about all this stuff that he saw on the other side, wonderful things. And then the son of God came to him and said, do you want a glimpse into heaven? which indicated he wasn't really in heaven itself, not in the final heaven, but he could have a glimpse just to kind of see over the other side. And typically in near death experiences, people will have, I say typically often they will come to a certain place beyond which they can't go any further. I think if they went further, they would actually experience death. They would actually be on the other side. But to say that, heaven has to be reduced down to a few glimpses that we have in scripture, uh, like back in the Old Testament when there'd be a very scary uh, experience with the throne room of God. Well, I don't think it all has to be scary with these wild beasts there. Heaven could be, uh, and, and I think is, uh, there, there's a lot of variety up there. We don't expect to see the same, have the same experience as somebody else. Not contradictory to what we read in the Bible, 
It's just that I don't think it's going to be the same thing over and over again. And we may be again in a vestibule rather than seeing the ultimate heaven. We're on right. the other side. Well, let me, let me ask you this. I think what, and I've seen a few kind of authors in the near death experience literature mention this, that you tend to see, especially among conservative Christians, a tendency for them to like near-death experiences up until they start mentioning things that disagree. Um, I know that uh, Dancing Past the Dark mentions this, that Christians have a tendency to agree with near-death experiences until they start mentioning things that you might not find within Scripture, and now suddenly the Christian feels like they're on grounds that they don't necessarily like. Um, for example, you know, an atheist experiencing heaven or a Muslim experiencing heaven or, or just someone from a, a background that obviously doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Or, or at least as far as we can tell, right? We don't know that for sure, but as at least as far as we can tell from their own testimony, that was not the belief that they had. So that kind of, I think, erodes at, at a Christian's perspective of near-death experiences as a valid form of, of evidence for God. So what do you think about that in, return, in regards to um, you know, people who are, for example, an atheist um, going and experiencing heaven? Um, how is that consistent with what we find, um, you know, in John three sixteen, or along many of the foundational teachings within the gospel? Sure. Well, I think um, I think that many. I think one of the things that shows me that near death experiences are authentic is, is that is that they don't tend to conform to our expectations of the other side. Christians at least when I was brought up, my thought of dying was that I was going to die. I was going to come before God. He was going to tell me whether I made it or not. And then, you know, you go into heaven. And so you don't think of this intermediate kind of state where there are angels talking to people or deceased relatives. But, but that's very biblical in that, um, you know, with the rich man and Lazarus parable, uh, the rich man died and angels took him to heaven. Well, where was he when he was in between death, the body separating uh, from, from the spirit and then taken by angels? And we kind of think, well, what's, what's the deal? You know, cut out the middleman. Why not? God can just take you straight there. Why have these angels doing things? I don't know. It's just the way God chooses to do things sometimes. So you have angels involved. And um, so I think it's, uh, again, with this vestibule of heaven type thing, I, I think it's important to get there because just because somebody is not a believer doesn't mean that they have a near-death experience, which is not their final death. It doesn't mean that automatically they should find themselves in hell, which is a final thing after the real death, right? Right. And so I think that... Um, I like in the book how you refer to it as a midterm it's a midterm instead of the final exam. Yes, yes. And so having a life review and you're able to see the ways you hurt other people and the ways you helped other people is kind of a life review, a little refresher there to see where you need to go from there. And I think we don't expect things like this to go through how to be saved. I'm not expecting somebody, an atheist or agnostic or anybody who has a near-death experience to go to the other side and Jesus or an angel says, okay, here's the right theology. You just don't hear about theology much. You don't hear people asking these questions that they've always wanted to have answers. What it seems to me, like with the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was a non-believer, okay? He was, he was persecuting Christians. And then, boom, he has this vision in the middle of it. And Jesus is talking to him. What's Jesus talking to a sinner not? Christian guy for? Well, he had to tell him that this was Jesus whom you're persecuting. He had a vision, but he was sent to someone else to talk to about to complete the matter. He didn't give him the whole gospel right there. He got that filled when he was on the other side. So I think God's a merciful God. I think he gives believers and non-believers experiences that if they're willing to seek, they should follow up on. So I see a lot of people who are atheists or agnostics, they'll have a near-death experience or have one in their family. They see themselves outside of their bodies. They may actually see, uh, get a life review by the being of light, which I believe is God or Jesus. And okay, they didn't go to heaven, 
they were never assured that they were going to go to heaven for the rest of eternity. Hmm. Uh, but now their life's changed and that they're thinking, okay, I've, I've got to get some answers. And uh, according to Sabon, Sabon was one of the early researchers in uh, near-death experiences who, um, who at first was very skeptical. And then he began studying his patients and found out, hey, these people are coming out of their bodies because they're describing exactly what was going on in their resuscitation experiences. So he becomes a stronger believer because of that. He was kind of a liberal, wishy-washy believer before. Then he started saying, man, th th this stuff's real began to study it in the Bible, and he did a second study on what happens to people after they've had these experiences. And he interviewed his patients, and he found out they got more serious about the Bible, more serious about prayer, um, more dedicated to their churches. And I think that's a thing that lead, can lead people, whether agnostics or atheists or whatever, to all of a sudden begin a life of searching and growing spiritually. Yeah, I've personally read a lot of accounts of people who were an atheist that had a near-death experience. And not, not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody gets a life review. Some people just have an OBE or out-of-body experience. And then, you know, that kind of is, is, you know, they feel a great sense of peace. And so, so they're not all going to heaven and having a heavenly experience. Um, however, it does make them start to think like from a naturalistic worldview, how do I explain what just happened? And a hallucination yeah. doesn't match up. And so that is interesting. So per, perhaps you're, um, would, it, would it suffice to say that it seems that God is using it almost as a certain form of revelation for these people, um, kind of like a special revelation for them, um, where they're having the opportunity to see some, some things that some people may not get to see in their lifetime, or at least in, in their, their physical lifetime, I guess you could say. I think. I think God knows what each person needs to experience and he gives us those experiences. He gives us every chance. And uh, for some people, I've never had that experience. I think that's what's led me and allowed me to go so in depth in my research on these things, because if I'd had an experience, then I wouldn't be in this search mode all the time. Yeah. But that allows me to have the motivation to get into things into a depth that others don't. I don't need the experience. Certain people do. And God knows who those are. So I don't think everybody is guaranteed to have an experience like that. But those who do, I believe God is, God is trying to bring to himself, give them every opportunity. And yes, they see things. So I see it more in the category of general revelation. I Just see, like okay. you can look at stars, you can look down at the nature of atoms and subatomic particles, and you can say, oh my goodness, this is just way too complex, unless there's a God. There's got to be a mind behind this thing. That's natural revelation. Atheists, everyone can look at that, and I think if they've got an open mind, they can just be wowed at the universe. But I believe also they can be wowed at miracles, and we saw it in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus shared his miracles with a broad swath of people and not everyone who saw those miracles became believers. Some began hardened and said, Oh, this is of the devil. And uh, of course he was crucified. Right. So not everybody takes that, but that's a form of general revelation to the miracles. And Jesus said, you know, some people, unless they see miracles, they simply will not believe. I believe that's John four forty eight. I used to think he was kind of saying that in a snarky way or rolling his eyes, you know, hey, they ought to believe, but oh my goodness, if, if they don't see miracles, they'll never believe. I think he was just making a statement. He was saying, I'm working these miracles because, because people just simply won't believe unless they see something miraculous. And, um, and so he worked these miracles throughout the Gospel of John to show that. Well, I think it's just another example of a miracle that he works in general for people. It's not special revelation like the Bible. It's general revelation, uh, but it gives people an opportunity to see and to make a decision. Interesting. Yeah, I, I really like that. And it is intriguing, right, when you look at Jesus's interaction with people along the Gospels, how he chooses to give a miracle to some and then some he refuses to give the miracle to. And he straight up tells them, even if I did do it, you wouldn't believe it. Um, so you, it, that is that is a really intriguing way of kind of because when you said that immediately the devil's advocate in me right immediately went to well 
you know, the atheist who, who wants to make the, the attack on God's all knowing power of saying, well, if he, if he's all knowing, why doesn't he give me the exact evidence? He would know the exact evidence I would need in order to believe. Why doesn't he provide that? Well, maybe he did and you just refused it. So it's, it's kind of interesting to kind of look at it from those, from those lines of, of seeing how some people might be like, well, if I had a near death experience, sure. I would believe, why doesn't God give me one? Um, and, and that's just a question we can't quite answer right now. Right. Because we don't know each individual's heart. I mean, some people are so hard they just won't even listen to the evidence. I find that a lot of people who critique near death experiences, deathbed experiences, and even miracles, it, it, they, they'll write a big long critique of it. And I'll notice they haven't even read anything on the other side because they already know it's wrong from the beginning or they don't want it to be right from the beginning. And so they don't even do their research. I think for people like that, they've hardened their hearts. And um, so why, why would God give them an experience if, if, if they're just going to try to explain it away and, and, and not never believe anyway? Right, right. No amount of evidence would be sufficient for them. I think uh, there's a couple of famous atheists uh, like Matt Dillahunty on, on YouTube that have been famously quoted in, in different debates. Mike Lycona was having a debate with him and saying, you know, what would it take to make you believe? And if I was to cut your head off right now and, or, or someone was cut my head off right now and then supernaturally reattaches to my body and I came back to life, would you believe in Matt Dillahunty is famously quoted saying, no, I'd look for some kind of natural explanation before determining that that's a supernatural event. And <laughs> Mike Lycona's like, well, don't you think that that's a bit high of a standard for you to have? Um, I mean, it's just you can raise the bar so high as a skeptic that it's impossible to provide you any level of certainty um, where, where you have that kind of Cartesian certainty of just it's, it's infallible in a sense. So, and so people like that to me are just not seeking. Jesus said, seek and you shall find. That's a present tense in the Greek, which means seek and keep on seeking. For a lot of people, I can see they're, they're just not seeking. They either just like to argue or they just dismiss things that they don't like. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, we are we are running short on time today, guys. Uh, I, I did manage to, sna to snag Dr. Miller for a short period of time. I do apologize. We can't go any further today, but I do have good news. In the future, we are going to be able to um, get Dr. Miller back on Pondering Christianity so that we can continue to discuss the near-death experience topic more and more along with his new research that's going into deathbed visions. Um, and we will be working together on some future uh, whiteboard um, projects to create more accessible information for you guys. So if you could do me a great favor, um, if you guys like today's content, hit that subscribe button and uh, we'll see you guys next time on Pondering Christianity. Keep on pondering.